I'm looking over where Bill Elliott usually sits. Uh oh, there we go. Where Bill Elliott usually sits, and I like what he does every time he gets up here and tells a little story. So I'm going to tell a little story. Um, uh, a um, woman, his third wife, and her husband were laying in bed listening to the next door neighbor's dog. It had been in the backyard barking for hours and hours. The wife jumps up out of bed and she says, I had enough of this. She says, I'm going to do something. So she goes downstairs. She finally comes back upstairs to bed and her husband says, the dog is still barking. What have you done? Well, I put the dog in our backyard. Let's see how they like it. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, thank you, um, program committee and board for letting me come up here. I've been up a few times in my uh, life with uh, science tech, and I always enjoy it. This is a good group. This is, a, this is one of the smartest groups that anybody can ever talk to, so uh, uh, I always en enjoy that. Um, as I unfold this story about education, I, I have a concern that there will be a feeling on the part of you that I am really uh, biased against the United States of America. That's just not true. Um, this talk is, is factual. I've got everything cited. I know where it came from. And it doesn't paint a pretty picture. Um, at least, certainly in my opinion, we'll, we'll see uh, how I do in terms of convincing you. My academic journey, when I academic journey, you know, I, I was a, a professor at IU, so I've taught, but that doesn't count when you're trying to teach kids, of course. But, uh, but I'm saying, looking at it from a point of view of a topic for research, began in 2013 as I documented why our son's uh, school got graded D. And uh, that led to a little study group and so forth, and ultimately a book that was published, and I'll show you a picture of it in just a minute. But I want you to know, I've already given the presentation on the book. That was some time ago uh, here, this lectern and so forth. But I will mention it, and I, there is a little bit of an overlap. When I paint the picture of what the U.S. education system is like, I did that in the book too. Uh, but I'll do a little bit more thorough, and uh, some new dimensions have come to it. So. Um, I look forward to going through this. The presentation that's written up in the program guide on the website is this one. And, uh, but I have another one that's more for like sports fans, I us call it that way. And uh, I call it education, the world's largest competition, the key to future economic viability, the playing fields of the world's classrooms, Here's a quote from Andre, Sch Andre Schrecker, who is the most knowledgeable person about uh, international education in the world. Uh, he said, the quality of schooling in a country is, is a good predictor of its economic viability. And if that is the case, then we got trouble here in River City uh, because uh, it's not a pretty picture. Um, so I'll be doing a rundown of the US team and some talk about the competition. Uh, and the competition I picked to talk and compare us to is the good competition. There are like 80, 90 countries out there that take these assessment exams, and you know, we don't want to compare ourselves to some country in Africa or something like that. So uh, I picked the good ones. All right, I said I wrote a book uh, written on education. Started in, the whole thing started in like 2013, and the book was published um, at the end of, um, December, late December in 2017. It isn't selling very well. Uh, another 999,999 books went out that year, so it's hard to, hard to get a, a place in the market. But basically what this book said is that uh, what we try to do is figure out why in that school did they have so much trouble teaching. And it all got down to disruptive children. And there were you know, there are a lot of kids that are not really too bad, they're disruptive, but there were kids that they just couldn't manage. And it was 23% of their classes. Those 23% cost them 28% of their teaching time. So when, uh, when we got into the discussion about, so what's different about these kids? They started saying, well, they just quit, and they just go to conflict, and they do all of these things, you know. 
And uh, so basically, I ended up sort of standing back and saying, well, it's character and grit. What we gotta teach them is character and grit. Schools do it. You can teach those things, so don't, don't think you can't. They should come from parroting, but uh, they don't. Some startling facts. When I started doing my research, instead of 25% of the US high school graduates are functionally illiterate, I wasn't going to use that 19% without knowing where it comes from. I hope I'm like a good New York Times reporter. And I dug for a day and I couldn't find it. Everybody was using 19%, but I couldn't find it where it came from. And finally, I found that there's an organization called the Program for International Assessment of Adult Competence. And they do kids and adults from 16 years to 65 years. And their latest report for 2017 is that 25% of our American high school students are functionally illiterate. They have five scales of literacy. To be functionally illiterate, it's a definition that I'm giving it because other people do the same thing. They're either in the first level or below the first level of competence in reading. So think about a quarter of all of our, of all our graduates can't really read and follow instructions and things like that, so it's gonna be hard for them to take jobs. 38% of them are numerically deficient. They can't do simple math problems and so forth. So that's not a pretty picture. That's not a pretty picture at all. The U.S. Department of Education has an, a frequently applied assessment of, of, of students and that assessment, you got six curves when I looked at it in my book. You've got reading, three curves for three different ages, and math for three uh, different ages. Out from 70 when they started to today's time, they haven't done one recently. They're basically flat, absolutely no change. Now statistically, uh, I ran a regression analysis on them, and five of those six curves had a very slight slope. But if you figure, you know, you take the equation that comes from it and say, how long will it take them to gain another five points on their test scores? It could be 100 years. What of was 300 years? So just because it's got a slope uh, doesn't mean much. Uh, what matters is how quickly will change occur. The uh, 2018 program around the world of the Program for International uh, Student Assessments that it's what uh, Schlechter heads up, showed basically that when in the last time I talked to you, I said we had mediocre results, and we still have mediocre results. And what I did was to point here, or show you the um, little pictorial that says, you know, falling short of proficiency, that 12.6% of our children are short on all three levels together, when you look at them together. So just another point that, yeah, we've leveled off. It may not be bad if you level off at the top, but we didn't level off at the top. We're level off uh, well below the top. Again, one of the things I said in my book, I got the data from Public Agenda in, in Brooklyn, a comp uh, outfit think tank headed up by, used, started by Cyrus Vance, Daniel Yankilovich, who was one of the great survey people. Uh, they found that 80% of America's uh, Schools have significant losses of time due to misbehaving children. They don't quantify how much. We did in this, my book, we quantified at least one small school, one group anyway. But there are about 100,000 public schools, so you multiply those two together, that gives you 80,000 schools that have major issues with their children. And when you read the responses of those questionnaires, there are many teachers that say these kids Certain kids should be absolutely removed from the campus, taken away, just get them out, and they don't do that, of course, they, they don't do that. So um, this is a major deterrent for recruiting new teachers. You talked, I just talked to somebody last week, two uh, young ladies came back from uh, student teaching and they said it was awful, awful. A friend of mine's daughter was in Teach for America down in New Orleans and she won't even, she'd never think about going into teaching because of the way uh, the kids behave. Um, the environment in some classrooms is absolutely deplorable. Now when I talked last time I gave a 13 minute uh, movie about a, a, a gal uh, who retired or resigned from the uh, Green Bay School Board and she laid out a litany of profanities and 
obscene things that happened in her Green Bay school, uh, and she could, I can't do this. I don't, I don't feel safe, I'm quitting. So she you know, did that in, in the public and it was on uh, YouTube. But basically I said they just flattened out. I, I, I said it not really spending, you can see flat curves. Those are the PSIA scores. Um, some facts continues. The average scores between the United States and the top performers is in the range of two to three grade levels. Grade levels. You'll see in a minute that the really good school systems give their kids in 10 years what we give them in 12. And uh, so that's, now a lot of them are Asians and they have a really fantastic work ethic, you know, and parental support, but that's our competition. Uh, U.S. millennials are some of the least well-educated uh, people in America. They're the, you know, you would think they've got all the technology going for them and so forth, it, 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 isn't, it isn't working. The United States spends more on instructional technology per student than any other nation, yet 33% of our high school grads, this is the third competency thing they did, is digital technology, uh, use of digital technology. 33% of our uh, children are technologically deficient in skills. So one third of our kids come out of high school where they've been exposed to computers their entire life and they really can't solve even the simplest digital problem. So technology isn't working. You know, we all get the feeling, well, the, the teacher will be obsolete and uh, we'll let the computer do it all. But uh, that just hasn't worked yet. Uh, Mitch Daniels put out a letter to the um, alums a, a year ago, and in that letter he points out that the most frequent grade given in high school these days are A's. So how do our school administrators deal with these issues? They give them A's. Now from their point of view, I can see why you'd want to do that. It keeps the parents off your back, keeps the kids off your back, the administration feels good about it, you know, how happy our kids are. It's just that on international scale, they're nowhere near an A student. <coughs> My nephew's son graduated from a, a high school in uh, Kentucky, and in the commencement ceremony, they pointed out how 53% of the class was graduating with honors. And the next year was even gonna be higher. <laughs> so, I mean, the plate, has been widened dramatically in U.S. education. If you don't like your grade scores for your school, what do they do? They lobby to bring in attendance. They lobby to bring in other things to dilute the role of the test scores so they get a better grade. So again, a, a case of widening of the plate. Now, um, again, the book had this graph. Uh, created probably in 2015, 2016, because you know it was an editing for many months, and uh, so. But uh, this is Darling Hammond, one of the two, three authors up there. She is a really uh, important professor at Stanford University, and when they produced that graph that I have in my book, we were going to be 112,000 teachers short a year, about a third of our need we would be short of, of college graduates that majored in education. That's now increased to two-thirds. We're gonna be, you know, 200,000 short out of a need of about 300,000 of getting qualified teachers. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you, and you probably know this, there's really only one thing that matters, and that's the teachers. To have them positioned right, paid right, and so forth. So, this is very disconcerting. Is this why our competency ratings have gone from 19 to 25? They did another one I didn't mention in, in 12, 14, and it was 20%. So, so in just a few years, we've gone from 20% competent, incompetent to 25%. And maybe because we can't get the teachers to teach them. All right, just like you, just like me, you read this in the paper and you, you take your page and somebody ought to do something about this. You know, I, I guess it's all right because I'm not hearing anything from the school systems and so forth about the situations that they face. So what's happening? Well, 
I have learned, and this is a quote from a text that I used, existing institution cannot solve the performance problem because they are the reason that it's that way. Surely the people that are in these school systems know the kind of things I'm talking about. They know the national assessment exams are flat. They know the I-STEP exams, are, which has been replaced, are, are not doing well. Why do they just let it happen? I don't understand. And, and the next quote is what the authors that I quoted from say. They are, they're in kind of a, a power clutch, an equilibrium, the unions and the superintendents and, the, and, and so forth, principals, they're in an equilibrium of power and they don't want to disturb that. And meanwhile, the kids get such, cut short. Uh, in a minute I'll talk about, I went to the uh, head of the School of Industrial Engineering, uh, that's one of my last slides, to try to lobby Avi Desh Deshmu uh, to pick up education as a center of excellence for industrial engineering. And uh, he said, well, that belongs in education. I, I shouldn't be doing that. And they said, I told them, no, they're part of the problem. You know, the people in the ed departments, uh, I, I never read anything in my research about their concerns about our school system. So something's really wrong there. And uh, the bureaucracy is really great at preserving the status quo. And that's what they do. If you're a teacher, the one thing you don't want to do is get on the wrong side of the bureaucracy. They'll have you either out of there or off into some school system across the street from a big factory or something like that. You know, they will punish you. Um, and as I said, well, you know, as I do my research and read all these papers and so forth, I don't read anything to speak of uh, about the problem and what can we do about it from the educators where you would expect it to come from. Now maybe they're so beaten down by the laws and so forth that have been passed, I, I have no idea why they don't do more. I, I visited with the head of the teachers union and I said to her, I talked about the, one of the, the study in the school, and I said, why don't you guys lobby for schoolroom conditions? If you talk about helping your people, you know, one of the best ways you would help your people is to give them an opportunity to do their jobs. And she said, well, you know, we're limited to compensation and um, uh, benefits. And I, I, I don't know whether that's true or not. All right, two topics of great importance, two of the, two of the big four. Intrinsic motivation. Now, I have, I have come to the conclusion from my work that that is a major, major element in the whole situation we're talking about here. That people go to school, people teach school uh, to a large extent because of intrinsic motivation. Teachers have extrinsic motivation in the form of salaries but if you're a teacher, for the most part, you're dedicated. It's a calling, and it's intrinsic motivation that does that. And I'm not talking about reading. <coughs> All right, the, the best model that I have seen of, of intrinsic motivation comes from uh, the University of Rochester, and it was done in the 70s. Um, and there are three basic needs, competency, ability to do something well, autonomy, exercise control over one's life, and then uh, relatedness, being on a good team, being a member of a good family, being a member of a good club. Uh, that those are the three things that they think motivate us. And that's why a lot of us, why are we here today? You know, you, you get some competency from the speakers usually. We usually gain knowledge. Autonomy, you don't have to come. That gives you some autonomy. You, know, you don't have to pay for them unless you come. And relatedness, it's a good club. I enjoy my table back here, my colleagues, and it's intrinsically motivating. So I'm gonna keep that in mind now. Reading, when, when you look at the stats and so forth, we do not produce good readers in America. Uh, and I got one more point that a large, a large number of just aren't reading proficiently. But reading, as we all know, is a, is a topic of obvious and critical relevance to learning. I had a long phone relationship with a teacher down in uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas, and she said, Dick, reading is everything. If you can't read, you can't do history, you can't do math, you can't do English, you can't do all of those things. So if, if a child doesn't know how to read, uh, they don't learn. So if 
a child is not reading at grade level by the end of the third grade, just an ordinary student, they're four times less likely to graduate, and if they come from the poor strata, they're six times less likely to graduate. So, I'll explain a little bit of that why. There is an undeniable connection between literacy skills and incarceration rates. So I usually don't talk about downstream stuff. You know, I, I worry about getting the kids educated today. But if you look at that little uh, chart there, the 20% is the 20% that used to prevail in terms of competency, which should now be upgraded to 25, but I don't have a graphic that does that. So I use this at 20. 20% 20 of the children are functionally illiterate. Now that's to say 25%. The next one says 70% of these, uh, of these kids, uh, no, I meant read it off here. I can't read it off here. There is a strong relationship between reading skills and ending up in jail uh, for whatever. So, Social promotion. I had a focus group interview with, with a bunch of folks from the uh, group called Fathers and Families, which is es Eskenazi Health uh, System organization. And they just happened to all be black because I wanted to, I talked to the leader of the thing about how are black attitudes about uh, education. And we had a focus group interview and one of the questions was, how do you feel about social promotion? And they said, what's that? So I had, a, I had a guy that was running the meeting, and he explained to him what social promotion was, where you advance a child, even though they are not competent in the skills they should have learned in the third grade, you move them on to the fourth grade. And once they heard that, they just rebelled against it. Absolutely not. You cannot advance those kids unless they're ready. So uh, social promotion, you got somebody that's going to leave the third grade, they can't read, at anywhere close to third grade level and you promote them and what happens? Go back to the intrinsic uh, uh, picture. Their competency does not grow. The red thing on the, on the one end, their competency doesn't grow. Their intrinsic motivation dies and they die on the vine and they're in class. They're, they know they're lost, you know, and some of them quit. Uh, very few of them graduate. So that's why intrinsic motivation, if you don't keep the competency level up, they are not going to want to stay in school because, uh, you know, they can compete if you do. Every child can learn to read. Can every child learn to read? So I, I asked myself, and I did a lot of research, can every child, why do we have so much trouble with reading in this country? Maybe there is something wrong with some of our brains that we just can't read, don't know how to read. Um, and I couldn't get anybody to answer that. I talked to a psychology friend of mine down at IU who was Professor Buddy, and um, he, he said, no, he doesn't think that's true at all. But then I found a study that uh, low IQs are capable of being taught to read. They took a, a, they took a group of kids that had pretty low IQs, and they taught them how to read. Well, the way I look at that, if my analytical perspective, is if we can educate the lower tail, then we ought to be able to educate the rest of the distribution. And that's what I say now. So um, if we are not teaching how to read, it's our fault. It's the parents' fault. There's nothing wrong with the kids. One teacher's dilemma. This is my daughter-in-law. She came over last night. They, we watched the Super Bowl together. She's a kindergarten teacher at a Marion County school. He has 26 students, 17 of them come to school with what she calls no print concepts. They can't identify the front of the book. They can't identify, they don't know how to read from left to right. They, didn't know, they have no idea how to approach the text from the bottom up, from the top down, from the right to the left or whatever. They have no feeling for that whatsoever. And um, Let's see, and nine children, uh, uh, nine children are okay readers. So the question you ask is, so what's gonna to happen to these okay readers and what's gonna to happen to the rest of them? Well, I'll tell you right now, one teacher who's got a class of 26 kids is not gonna bring those 17 kids up the curve to have them reading. 
back to the focus group interview, those people felt that if a kid cannot read by the time they get into kindergarten, it's too late. I mean, they must enter kindergarten with the ability to read. So basically what I told these folks when I got done, men and women, was that, you know, I could have had this conversation with a bunch of white people in, in Washington Township and it, it, it's all the same and I don't know how many times I have to learn that lesson. Uh, you know, they think like we do. These people did anyway. So um, at least I know that now. Okay, so uh, the other thing that's really bad is that she told me she spends 60% of her time in discipline and classroom management, 60%. So she needs help. She needs at least one other teacher, maybe two other teachers. And we're gonna see in a minute, that's how they do it in, in the international world. Okay, here's a chart, a little group participation now. Uh, what slide are we on? Anybody see that? Number 15. This will be the longest slide. Uh, this is on collaborative learning, uh, collaborative problem solving, and it plots the United States against Hong Kong, and along the x-axis at the far left are the most uh, deprived uh, socioeconomic students. And then the second quartile, third quartile, and then the, on the far right are the most advantaged. And then up on the x-axis are the scores of their exams in this particular particular thing. So the question I have for you guys is if you want to increase your scores, how are you going to do it? You're not going to get anything out of the upper end. That's going to be like the pivot point. So what you got to do is you got to, you got to take the lower end and raise it up. You got to educate the low socioeconomic people. Again, you'll see around the world that's what the really good systems do. And just as Alan was pointing out, the only way is that's a 39 point gap there between uh, Hong Kong and the United States. You gotta lower that gap. You gotta, the flatter that curve is, the more egalitarian the system is. And you know, you gotta raise that curve. And to do that, you gotta educate uh, the poor. I hate to, I hope that's all right to use that word. Now, um, here I show that the U.S. is an 80-point differential between the upper part of the red line and the lower point. So that's kind of a representation of slope. That's an 80, I'm making that up, I mean that's 80 points of slope, let's say. And the Hong Kong line is only 35. And you've got to get that raised up. Now here's another one. This is reading. Uh, Hong Kong, the difference is 59. Uh, Estonia is uh, 61 and the United States are 99. So again, you've got some curves that are relatively flat, and then you've got the United States that's pretty steep. So the only way you can fix that problem is by educating the poor. We must educate our disadvantaged. Top performing countries have made explicit decisions about doing this. The reason Hong Kong is where it is is not because they don't have any poor. They are dedicated to teaching them uh, as students. Uh, every top performing country um, uh, knows that it costs more to educate students uh, uh, with its advantages than those with advantages. Provide more resources to at-risk students. In America we do the opposite. You know, we have some of our least capable teachers least paid teachers teaching these children. Better educated uh, people are, it'll elevate our scores as a nation. We're not just concerned about educating scores, we're talking about effective citizens. I'm saying here, if you don't do it at home, you gotta do it in school. I talked to a lady where we live in Wisconsin about that, and she said, over my dead body. If the parents don't do it, tough luck. But, you know, what's it, what's it mean for the society? You know, we end up with people in prison and so forth. So I, I, if they don't do it, we've got to do it. That's my parenthesis, or my uh, point here. Um, it can be done. Jeffrey Canada, anybody know that name? The Harlem Children's Zone. I read a book called Whatever It Takes. Jeffrey Canada is, is a black guy. 
And he's had major successes in Harlem, but boy, it was not easy. It took him a lot of experimentation. There are a lot of schools, the Oaks Academy. We got schools in this city and in the state that do it, but we don't learn from them. State of Massachusetts, if you look at the, uh, the uh, scores of country uh, groups on these PISA exams, you see that Singapore and Hong Kong and so forth are the top. If Massachusetts were a state, it would be in the top 10, all right? So they submit their scores to be treated just like a country, and they come out really well. So how do they do that? Well, in 1993, the, the governor signed a bill that would divert more funding to the low-income schools. So somebody like me got up in front of him or something, and they said the only way to do this is to raise the bottom of that curve, and that's exactly what they did. Now, the last point down there at the bottom was um, Diane Kelly said it's, the, it's immediate. We're getting tremendous results from that. So they did that long ago enough that now they are one of the top countries in the, nation, in the world if they were a country. So they have really benefited from paying money to educate the poor people. So long as we have a property tax system, it's going to be hard to do that. The rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. So uh, I'm not a wild-eyed socialist, don't, don't let me point that out, but you know, I'm just saying, what are we going to do to get this job done? As I read and read and read about top, uh, top flight school systems around the globe, I'm going to give you some of the words that I run into so you can get some idea without me going into too much more detail. Teachers are top of the class and they earn competitive salaries. They recruit only the best people for teachers. They are respected in their communities. They are paid well, and they end up being leaders in their schools. They end up doing things that are done now in the office of the superintendent. I tried to find the phone directory for the Washington Township Schools Superintendent's Office. I couldn't find it anywhere. It's a huge office up on uh, 86th Street, full of expensive people, and they're all bureaucrats. <laughs> Very high standards for students. They don't, they don't distinguish standards for poor kids and standards for uh, uh, rich kids. Curriculum, demanding, rigorous, and they are proud of the hard work that they do. Now what's gonna happen in this country if we started to do that, we'd have to do it kind of slow as the parents can say, my kid's all stressed out. <laughs> and I don't want my kids stressed out. Well, that, that, I mean, that's between a family and a school, but, but in terms of the global international picture, uh, a lot of these other kids are really stressed out in China and so forth, and sometimes it's even cruel. But I don't, I don't know, we gotta decide. Uh, I don't, you know, I hear about rigor and so forth in football practice and basketball practice. I don't hear about it much in schools and their exams. Uh, no Child Left Behind. That was, of course, a program uh, initiated by our uh, National Education Department, and uh, it just kind of fell on deaf ears. They legislated it and said, this is what we're gonna do, here are the rules and so forth. But in these countries, that is an absolute uh, outcome. If they have to go to school on Saturdays, they have to go to school more weeks in a day, they have to go to school in summers, that's what they do. They leave no child behind. The Oaks Academy leaves no child behind. Kaizen. If you see the way, everybody know that's never an improvement, Japanese for never an improvement. If you see the way these teacher groups work within the school, they are constantly trying to get better. Constantly worried about making improvements. So um, they believe in Kaizen. State creates an integrated system beginning to end. Now this would really be tough to take. There's a group up at the top of the state. Now state, if Singapore, that's a small state. Same way with Hong Kong. But they do everything. They send down the syllabi, they send down the exams, they tell the schools of education how they should educate their teachers. So they have really a lot of control over what happens. Um, demand competency at every stage, no social promotion, uh, offer a variety of tracks, and I'll show you that in a minute. Flat organization, teachers have power. Teachers have uh, no autonomy. I, in my book, I say they're the least empowered profession in America. They are like serfs on an early uh, uh, 
organization in Europe. Teachers are the key. The top performers have built their systems around high quality teachers. We have built our system around cheap teachers. Cheap teachers. Barely able to get by lobbying the government all the time for more money and sometimes getting it and sometimes not. And we're now going to be 200,000 short of those every year because we don't do it right. Topics, uh, performers without exception have made these teachers the key to their success. They're leaders. One would think that a system with cheap teachers ought to be cheaper to run than one that's not. Now, all of those that come from industry, Mark, it's good to see you. Uh, we, um, we all know that when people questioned about quality, we can't afford to have that kind of quality. But people who got the quality realized they got paid back for it. They got their, their money back. You know, so the same thing's going to be true here. Well, it turns out it's very expensive to do it that way. International competitive uh, data shows that our approach is more expensive than running with cheaper uh, students, cheaper teachers. College for everyone, absolutely not. That's a crazy scheme, I think. Absolutely not. Only one out of 10 low-income kids ever get a college degree. So you've got 90% of them you've got to do something with. And we'll solve what happens with those in just a minute, what we'd like to see happen. In the advanced uh, nations, none of them send a majority of their students on to college. The majority of the students go to vocational skills. And their economies depend on those. So you hear about the apprentice system in Germany. It's wonderful because these kids have vocational skills. And some university capable students prefer to take the vocational track. So there's not a stigma associated with being on the vocational. It's just another nice track to have. We had a debate on that in our, in our focus group interviews. And some guys were talking about, you know, if I can go to work, I can build a house and so forth, and you're going to be paying off your debts. So you'll never get your money back. There is the diagram that shows the tracks. School begins at K, grade K, and in that spread there, there's, I don't know what happens in K to, to 9 or K to 10, but uh, the training is going on. But when they get into higher levels, they have four tracks, an advanced track for the really best students. They do the common core. Somebody told me that read my presentation, don't use the term common core because it, it connotes so many bad things. We changed it in Indiana to Indiana Academic Standards. And, uh, but they use it around the world because it's just a list of the things that kids should know at every grade level. So they can easily do that common core, so they give them a whole bunch of other things. It could be history of art, it could be music, it could be a lot of things to keep them engaged so that at the end of the 10th grade up there where they cross that line, they are, you know, they're going to go into AP classes for the next two years. They stay in high school, but so they enter college much further down the pike. The standard track with many students, this track is what you would expect. That's where the kids are going to go to college. They finish the Common Core in, in 10 years, and then they go to AP classes themselves. The next one is the vocational track. And uh, it's very applied. And as what I read about these schools, they don't have the motivation problems because the kids, particularly in that crack, can see where they're going. So, um, and then the track for the weaker students, you can see that they take 12 years, but they teach them the Common Core. They stick with them. And uh, what happens to them when they get out? I don't know. Uh, they, they, I just don't have an answer to that. What's happening now? American education reform is a, a, a series of random acts of intervention. And, and as I say there, when you get the state and the national level involved, you get more random acts of intervention. There isn't any consistent, any consistent approach to it. Now, my recommendation. So who's going to solve this problem? The first line up there is you see industrial engineers. Well, I don't know whether the IEs at Purdue are ever going to pick this up or not. He just got back from a year of sabbatical, and he said that uh, I'm going to totally reorganize this group. 
And engineering, if you read the alumni magazines, and a lot of us are engineers, they're getting into all kinds of bizarre fields. A lot of work in medicine, a lot of work in uh, things that normally are not part of what you would consider an engineering curriculum. And a guy that wrote an article about my book for the Purdue kept talking about engineering thinking and education. And he kept saying, that's what we need. So I tried to convince Avi to do that, and he was not very convinced. He kept thinking about should be from the Department of Education. So who knows what he'll do in the next couple of years, but I I'm, I'm doubt if he'll do anything on education. But who else is going to lead this charge? Uh, I'm certainly I'm, I'm trying to get some motion started, but I'm just a little tiny cog here in this big system. So we'll have to wait and see. Now, Lily uh, Dalmont could do it. So that's it. Uh, all about teachers, reading, intrinsic motivation, and parenting. So, end of story. Thank you all very much.